Hello to everyone who's coming in. Just gonna let everyone else sign in and get started. So good afternoon and welcome today's, to today's disputation. My name is Rick Barry and I'm an assistant professor of theology. This is the inaugural event of the Disputatio project, which is an initiative of the humanities program. Over the coming years, the Disputatio project will host a series of lively debates on issues of contemporary and or perennial significance in the great Dominican tradition of disputation. The project will also produce resources for professors and students to help them to take advantage of the Disputatio method for the 21st century classroom and beyond. One of our major goals today is to introduce you to the Dominican tradition of disputation and to suggest why this approach remains important for the modern world. One of the fascinating things about Providence College is that our mission statement explicitly claims that PC, and quote, encourages a pedagogy of disputed questions. This is amazing because very few colleges explicitly state a preference for a specific approach to education. This raises obvious questions. What is the disputed question? And why is it so important at PC? The fact is that disputation has been a hallmark of Dominican education since the early 13th century, which is to say since the time of St. Dominic himself. It was typical for Dominican classes to feature a private disputation every week and for the entire school community to come together occasionally for major public disputations. As one scholar explained it, the private disputation was presided over by a master who announced beforehand the question that would be asked. One student designated the opponent supplied arguments against the thesis, while another, the respondent, attempted to answer the objections that were raised and to determine their weaknesses. In the medieval period, after the students went back and forth with objections and responses, the exercise would culminate with the determination, at which point the master would give his concluding remarks on the question based on the issues raised in the debate. In these debates, the goal was to help students to think on their feet, to consider and respond to diverse arguments and to master the material at a deeper level by engaging it dialogically. The overall assumption was that when you ask hard questions and you subject each position to thoughtful objections, the truth would emerge. Truth, after all, has nothing to fear from challenging questions. While the modern college is, of course, very different from the medieval universities where, where the first Dominicans flourished, there are also many ways in which our goals are similar. For example, both then and now, we are encouraged to engage classic texts with sophistication and discernment. Then and now, we strive to better become better communicators, both in our writing and in our oral presentations, so that they can positively influence others. Then and now, we celebrate clear thinking and creative problem solving as the best way to confront challenges. The disputed question is a time-tested, lively, and fun way to pursue these goals in continuity with the Dominican approach to education over 800 years. With all that in mind, our goal today is to get a sense of how disputation works with the help of two friars who have been joyfully debating each other for many years. Since I have called the debate, I am serving as the host for today. The question I have posed is as follows. Are social media platforms the cigarettes of the 21st century? Today, we have Father Bonaventure Chapman and Father Dominic Werner debating this question. Father Bonaventure will take the nay position. He will say that social media platforms are not the cigarettes of the 21st century. Father Bonaventure is a Dominican friar who is a PhD student in philosophy at the Catholic University of America and who is a former visiting assistant professor of philosophy at PC and a former campus, campus chaplain. Father Dominic will take the yay position. He will argue that social media platforms are the cigarettes of the 21st century. Father Dominic is also a Dominican friar and a PhD candidate in theology at the University of Notre Dame. And he's also a former visiting professor of theology at PC and a former campus chaplain. Neither of these men have any special expertise in social media platforms, 
nor do they even have expertise in smoking cigarettes. But they do have a history of engaging each other in disputation. When they were at PC, they started the Devil's Advocate series of debates on issues of faith and morals. So I expect they will be great models of how to debate rigorously and charitably. The disputation will unfold in four parts with Father Bonaventure giving as many reasons as he can for saying no to the question I just stated. I will put the time limits for each of the four rounds in the chat so you can see how long each round should take. Throughout the debate, please send me questions and we'll have a question and answer period at the end. If you're doing this for extra credit, feel free to put your name and your professor's name on the question. I'll ask the question anonymously, but I'll let your professor know that you went above and beyond by asking a question. With that, I invite Father Bonaventure to make his opening statements. Magister Barry, esteemed clerics and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I say to the question on the table, nay. Social media platforms are not the cigarettes of the 21st century. In order to show this, I will do what all good medieval disputants do by first making relevant distinctions and then arguing from the relevant authorities. I trust that at the end of this dispute, Magister Barry and others, all of you will agree with the nay response. But let me begin with the relevant distinctions first. Before answering a question, it's good to know what the question actually is asking. So what is this question that we are asking asking? Are social media platforms the cigarettes of the 21st century? It's asking about a likeness, an analogy between social media platforms, which I'll call SPMs for short, and cigarette smoking. And the question is, what kind of likeness is it asking about? Well, it's not a physical likeness. Like, are these the same size, color, shape, taste, that sort of thing? No, I think the likeness is a moral likeness. It's, are they something related morally to each other? Do they have some moral relationship that we should do them or shouldn't do them? So it's a normative likeness, not descriptive. Okay, but what kind of moral likeness is that? Are we saying that SPMs are good like cigarettes are good? Or are we saying that they're bad like cigarettes are bad? Well, I take it that we can assume for this debate, although if Father Dom wants to go for this, that's fine, that cigarettes are, the analogy here is that these are bad, that SPMs are bad like cigarettes are bad. And then finally, the third important distinction. What kind of badness is this? Are we answering the question whether cigarettes are bad and SPMs are bad in some generic sense in the way that say stealing candy from children is bad or throwing turtles at old people is bad? Is it some just badness or is it a specific kind of badness? Well, I think the point of the question is that there's something about the badness of cigarette smoking that draws to mind an analogy with the badness of SPM, social media platforms. So the question really at issue is this, are SPMs morally bad in the way that cigarettes are morally bad? And I contest that the answer to this question is nay. SPMs are not morally bad in the way that cigarettes are morally bad. But to figure this out or see this, let's look at a few authorities to find out what that specific badness is related to cigarettes that is different from SPMs. So first, cigarettes I think are bad specifically in two ways. They're bad for the individual and they're bad for the community. And I'll start with the individual. My authorities come from first, St. Paul. There he is, first Corinthians six. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Are you not your own? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The second authority, I think we can all agree, is an important one. This is St. Thomas Aquinas from the Summa, Summa, the Summa Theologiae, Secunda Pars. He says, now the nature of our body was created not by an evil principle, as the Manichaeans pretend, but by God. Hence, we can use it for God's service. Consequently, out of the love of charity with which we love God, we ought to love our bodies also. 
What's the point of St. Paul and St. Thomas here? It's this, your personal health is not something to be taken lightly. St. Paul says that we have been bought by God and belong to him. And St. Thomas says that we love God by loving and caring for our own bodies. So personal health is no small thing. And yet, this is precisely what cigarettes strike at, per se, essentially, the health of the body. I don't intend to bore you with statistics, since I think you already know them all. Uh, the, in broad brushstrokes in this debate, cigarettes, leading cause of cancer and death, lung disease, and all sorts of physical ailments. In fact, cigarette smoking is per se, not per accidents. It's intrinsically unhealthy. It is impossible to separate the health risk from smoking cigarettes in a different way that it is possible to separate the accident risk from driving cars. So that's the first specific badness about cigarettes is they physically harm the individual. Now, the second thing is against the community's good. And here I cite authorities, of course. First, God, Genesis 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Second source is the philosopher, Aristotle. It's too hard to share a screen, so I go quick. It is evident that the city belongs among the things that exist by nature, and man is by nature a political animal, zoon, politicon. And the last, and perhaps most important, is Coach Crowley, head coach of the women's basketball team at Providence College, who simply begins every game and every time the ladies leave the bench with the cheer and chant, together, together. What's the point of Genesis, Aristotle, and Coach Crowley? It's this. We are not meant to be alone. We are, as human beings, situated in a social framework of expanding proportions. First, our family, our local community, and our nation, and then in some sense, humanity in general. We are social or political animals by nature. Not initially, we are born as individuals, but if all goes well in our development, we will not be alone in our life. Thus, anything that works against community and our social nature is something that of itself works against us as humans. And again, this is precisely what cigarettes do. They work against the common good, and not incidentally, but at their essence. They are anti-communal activities. How so? Well, first, they separate us from others. Smoke breaks, smoking rooms, segregated areas. This is the language of smoking in space and time. Why? because the majority of people don't want to be around someone smoking a cigarette. In fact, we make laws about these things so that you, you may not inflict your smoking habit, which does harm to individuals that are not smoking. You have to separate from the current community to smoke. And that's very different than chewing gum. But it is also anti-communal in another sense. It attacks the common good and shifts burdens to others. Smoking is a leading cause of cancer and puts pressure on healthcare and common welfare state policies. Smoking leads statistically to asking other people to pay around $300 billion a year in the United States for your smoking. It decreases the common good for a private good. The question under dispute when properly distinguished is this, are SPMs bad in the way that cigarettes are bad? Our authorities from the scriptures to Coach Crowley identify two ways in which cigarettes are bad. They are intrinsically bad for the individual's health and for the common good's health. Cigarette smoking works against both of these goods intrinsically and not accidentally. And that's an important distinction, intrinsic versus accidental. And it is key to my case. Cigarettes may be accidentally good for the individual by reducing stress, for instance, and accidentally good for the community by friends that go out and smoke on breaks. But this is accidental because these can be replaced. You can do other things to relieve stress and do other things to hang out during work. But the harms to the individual and the community are not accidental. It's if lung cancer just happens to occur to people who smoke or the people are forced to inhale smoke by accident when you smoke next to them. These harms are intrinsic to the act of smoking and there are the reasons why it is morally bad to do so. But SPMs are not like this. They, their harms are not intrinsic to the use of, of themselves. You cannot claim, and I think you know, use social media in ways that are not harmful to your individual or common good at all. Social media does not have the negative physical effects of the body like cigarettes smoking does. 
unless we are talking about we're, we're in your eye. It's not a physical thing. Social media does not have, by its nature, even negative social consequences. Note, note carefully, it may have them, but it need not. Social media, in fact, is designed or was designed for exactly the opposite purpose, the development of common goods and communication and information and community with those who are physically distant. The question under dispute is whether there is a good analogy between a cigarette smoking and SPMs, whether social media platforms are like smoking in the relevant sense to warrant a connection. And in saying, and, and I say nay, and it's important to distinguish what I am not saying from what I am saying. I'm not saying nay to the question, are SPMs bad for you? Or are they problematic? What the question under dispute is, is whether they're bad in the morally relevant way. And I claim that this is a distinction which matters. Why does it matter? Because the problem is if you don't make this relevant distinction and you lump together cigarette smoking and social media platforms, then you throw out all the potential goods of, of social media platforms, which I assume you can imagine there are some. And you treat SPMs as a guilty pleasure instead of a potential benefit to the individual and society. And that's the key. If you were asked to imagine benefits to individuals and society for SPMs, I'll bet you could. But what benefits to individuals and society do smoking cigarettes really offer? When you realize that these two questions get different answers, you realize that the analogy between SPMs and smoking cigarettes is not a good analogy. The answer to our disputed question is nay. Thank you, Father Bonaventure. Uh, we will now turn to Father Dominic, who will have roughly 12 minutes to offer a general response and also to reply to the objections that Father Bonaventure has given. Father Dominic. Father Dom, we can't yet hear you. There you are. All right, thank you, Dr. Berry, for the uh, invitation to participate in this dispute. Thank you to my disputation partner, Father Bonaventure. It's good to see you, as always. Uh, always love the visual aids. Um, so are social media platforms the cigarettes of the 21st century? I answer that yes, they are. And social media platforms are the cigarettes of the 21st century in four ways. First, cigarettes are addictive and social media is addictive. Second, cigarettes pose risks to individual health. Social media poses risks to individual mental health. Cigarettes do harm to third parties via secondhand smoke, and social media platforms do harm to third parties, especially by disseminating falsehoods and exacerbating polarization. And fourthly, cigarette companies lack a fiscal incentive to be forthright about harms and to regulate themselves. And similarly, social media platforms lack a fiscal incentive to be forthright about harms and to regulate themselves. Before giving these arguments, I wanna grant that social media platforms are not like cigarettes in a very important respect. You have to pay for cigarettes. Social media platforms are free. But this important difference is actually the key to understanding all the similarities I mentioned. It's often said that, that if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. And the product that social media platforms sell is the attention of their users. Your attention is the product and advertisers are the consumers. But it, it's not just your attention, however. If it were, we could say that social media platforms are just like television and radio. The added value that the social media platforms offer to advertisers is certainty. Certainty that their ad will have the attention of the right person at the right moment, feeling the right feelings. They sell your attention and they sell certainty about your desires. And they create this product by tracking everything you do on the platform to create a model to predict your desires and your behavior at every moment. They track precisely how long you look at an image, how long you engage with a post, the kind of people in your network, the kind of comments you make, what you like and dislike, at what time of day, at what location, they run this amazing amount of data through machine learning algorithms to construct a predictive model of your behavior that maps onto your personality type, your interests, your relationship status, even down to your current mood. And these predictive models are scarily good. 
just think of the last time, you know, an ad appeared on your social media account and some about something you were just talking about. I mean, it's unlikely that your phone is listening to you uh, in your conversations, although the technology is certainly there to do that. Um, but it's just these predictive models are freakishly good at knowing your interests and basing their advertising strategies upon your current desires and interests. And the model which these algorithms create is used to design a user experience in real time that best controls your attention. This is the reason for what appears in your feed and your notifications. It's the reason for the like button, for photo tagging, for the infinite scroll. It's all engineered and fine-tuned to make their platform addictive to capture your attention, to sell it to advertisers. And this brings me to the claims that I wanna argue. Like cigarettes, social media platforms are addictive. There's no nicotine, no chemical addiction, of course, but neither do slot machines have, have uh, nicotine or work by chemical addiction, and yet they can be quite addictive. And they actually work in a similar way. Slot, machine, slot machines offer a chance of some natural reward, monetary, and then you perform an action for that chance. You pull the lever or hit a button. It's called positive intermittent reinforcement. The seeking pathways of the brain are activated and dopamine is increased. It's the same way that rats are trained to pull a lever to get a chance at a food pellet. In social media, the reward is an attractive image or affirmation or some socially useful information or righteous indignation or an ironic meme, some good feeling or some angry feeling. The lever is the clicking on the notification or the scrolling down the feed. And casinos are designed so you can't go anywhere without running into a slot machine. That's how they try to keep you into the, into the gambling. And social media platforms put the casino in your pocket. Like cigarettes, social media platforms are addictive. Now, cigarettes pose risks to individual health and social media platforms pose risks to individual mental health. My second point. Some might say that even if social media can be addictive, it's a harmless addiction. You know, true, it, it doesn't give you lung cancer. But recent, recent research has shown that it does increase risks to harm to mental health. The use of social media strongly correlates with increases in depression, self-harm, and suicide, tragically. And since the invention of Instagram in 2010, it's about this same time that smartphones were really going mainstream, putting these social media platforms in everyone's pocket, there has been a 189% increase in self-harm in girls aged 10 to 14, and 151% increase in suicide in girls of the same age since 2009. And since that time, there's also been a significant increase in body dysmorphic dis disorders, with kids comparing themselves to filtered images and seeking plastic surgery at a younger and younger age. And several studies have shown that adolescents and young adults who spend more time on social media rank lower in well being and happiness. One uh, recent study from the researchers at the Pittsburgh School of Medicine found that the odds of depression increase with the frequency of social media use, that those in the highest quartile of social media frequency. Uh, use, they have a three times greater odds of having depression than those in the lowest quartile. The social media platforms may not cause cancer, but they increase the risk of harm to mental health. And it's not just the individuals who use social media that are harmed by it, its use. Which brings me to my third argument. Cigarettes do harm to third parties via secondhand smoke. And social media does harm to third parties by disseminating falsehoods and exacerbating polarization. There was a, a 2018 study by researchers at MIT that found that false reports of events on Twitter traveled six times faster than true reports. And they theorized that it was largely due to the greater emotional reaction that these false stories were designed to provoke. You're more likely to share a story that provokes a strong emotional reaction in you. And the, the bizarre, you know, pizza, pizza gate conspiracy in 2016 is just one example. You know, it spread like wildfire on social media. And it almost led to a tragedy when an armed man stormed into a pizza shop with a rifle 
in an attempt to break up this imagined pedophile ring. And, and we see similar, uh, more real uh, tragedies in, in re most recently in um, Myanmar, where uh, there's been a recent genocide of Rohingya Muslims. It was largely facilitated by propaganda and lies disseminated on Facebook by the Myanmar uh, military. Uh, so we don't have to be looking and using social media to be affected by this. Like secondhand smoke, social media harms third parties. You don't have to have a social media account to have a crazed conspiracy theorist break into your pizza parlor with a rifle. And it doesn't matter if you were on Facebook or not, if you were a, a, a poor Rohingya Muslim in Myanmar in 2018, your life was in danger. And so like uh, cigarettes, social media harms even third parties. So finally, it brings me to my fourth point that cigarette companies lack a fiscal incentive to be forthright about harms and to regulate themselves. And so too, social media platforms these companies, they lack a fiscal incentive to be forthright about harms and to regulate themselves as well. Now, cigarette companies, they make money by selling a harmful product. They have no reason to publicize the dangers of their product. And social media companies, as was said, they make their money by selling your attention and the certainty of your desires to advertisers. And they have no reason to publicize and to own how their platforms harm you in catching your attention and selling it to advertisers. Their business model by its nature rewards growth. The more users they can add to their platform, the better. The earlier they get people hooked on their network, the younger they expand their user base, the more money they stand to make. And for all of these reasons, I argue that yay, the social media platforms are the cigarettes of the 21st century. That concludes my opening statement. With the time left, I'd just like to respond quickly to a couple of cl claims made by Father Bonaventure. Um, so he mentioned that we are at citing some, some very strong authorities, I have to say, God among them, that, that uh, human beings are social animals uh, by nature and social media um, platforms are designed to facilitate that sociality. And as I've already said, they weren't designed to facilitate sociality. Uh, they're designed to make money. Um, they're designed to make money. And if uh, sociality is a, a externality, a, a side effect of that money-making uh, goal, then so be it. Unfortunately, we found that it's actually quite the opposite that those who use are most invested in the use of social media actually have less face-to-face -face interactions with their peers than those who use social media less. And we're finding that, that uh, social media use correlates with greater isolation and greater, as I, as I mentioned, incidence of mental health difficulties. So even at that, at that level, we can say that, uh, that the objection that these products are designed to serve the good of human sociality that is false, they're designed to make profit, and they actually are parasitic upon human sociality. Thank you. Thank you, Father Dominic. Uh, we'll now turn for our second round back to Father Bonaventure, and he will have seven minutes maximum to offer any clarifications and distinctions he would like as he responds to Father Dominic's argument. Father Bonaventure. Well, thank you, Father Don, for your uh, for the responses. Always a pleasure to uh, to lock horns, as it were. Um, I'll respond quickly to Father Father Dom's uh, responses to to my my comments, and then I'll make some responses to his opening statements, and then final some general some general points. Um, so the main focus he he responded with to my arguments was the reason that social media platforms were designed, they were designed to make money uh, and not to further social social goods. Um, I suppose that's not, from my, from my part, I don't 
bother too much with what they're designed to do or why they were created initially, that's some sort of a genetic fallacy. It seems to me it's whether they do social, whether they do ask, actually assess or create social bonds in some sort. And that's, so the designed one, as far as I'm making money, well, bars, sports and arenas, gyms, all these things are designed to not just for pure altruism, but for the, for profit, of course. How could, why would you do anything else in a way outside the family? Um, but the question is, do they, do they help us socially? Well, the study is, uh, some, are, some are clear, some aren't. Um, it seems that in, if you are the most active on social media, studies actually have in the top 15%, top you are also the most active face-to-face face -face as well. But even if you weren't, even if, even if it did cut down your face-to-face -face time, it does allow you to be social in ways that you wouldn't have had before. So connecting with people from distant areas, so your grandparents sharing pictures that you couldn't do before. So there's always a trade-off with that, seeing someone face-to-face -face, as opposed to sending or communicating or sharing um, images or stories or what have you with those who are distant from you um, is an aspect of sociality, which is not achievable by just face-to-face -face if your grandparents or someone or friend lives farther and farther away. So that's a trade-off. So I would say that they are not in, they're not in principle against sociality. It's a different kind of sociality and expansion in a way of digital sociality to those we have, although it does run risks. And I wanna to get to that in the last point, of course. Let me respond then to um, some of Father Dom's some points. He made four arguments that cigarettes are addictive, cigarettes uh, pose risky to individuals' health, they harm third parties, and then cigarette companies lack financial incentives to regulate. Um, well, I suppose I'll start with the last one move for, and move back forward to the front. Cigarette companies, it, as far as regulation, I don't know, they, well, um, if someone wants to have a social media tax, that's fine. Um, that this is all business models need to have growth. So the idea that they have incentives to grow doesn't strike me as that particularly interesting. What more interests me are the two, the aspects of this, this third position, which is truth. So the aspect that they harm the third parties, which I said was good, we agree on that. The community is a good. And that social media platforms like cigarettes harm third parties, even though they're not participating on the issue of truth. But of course, newspapers do this, gossip does this any sort of thing does this um, that has information disseminating. So it might, it might make it faster, but the fact that social media adds something new to the equation of propaganda and such, such that the genocides of the 20th century, which were a lot of them before social media couldn't have occurred, uh, that doesn't strike me. This is a specific thing to, to, to cigarettes and social media platforms. This just means when you involve truth, you involve falsehood as well and how you go about this. Let me move that up to the individual the level which you both agree on is very important. So the individual risk for cigarettes, of course, is a physical thing. Uh, cancer, it's serious money spent and all of this and the suffering and all the statistics that I didn't bother quoting. The, the question over on the other side is the mental health issue. I worry a bit that we start to treat mental health and physical health as if these are the same thing. And we start to treat human beings as if they, that their mental health and their psychological states are just as deterministic and causally connected as their physical health is. I think it's true that there is a possibility for mental health, and of course there are statistics for this correlations, but mental health is a societal issue, a familial issue, a social issue, all these other things which I would not want to reduce to some sort of simple equation, that I worry that if you make this analogy, it starts to think that we're, we're a bit like robots and that well, if one thing shows up in correlation, the other thing shows up, Cigarettes have a physical individual cost. They damage you every time you smoke them. They add something to you. Social media doesn't have that, it doesn't have that. And that the last thing is the addictive quality to it. Again, I think this is like the newspaper business. Addic addiction is something that, well, coffee has this too, I suppose. Um, casinos, lottery tickets, all of this. His, the motion of addiction was based on uh, furthering uh, endorphins or furthering some sort of stimulation. Well, lots of things have that. So the addiction, it doesn't get in the specific way that cigarettes get at it. it. They're addictive, but so are lots of other things. So unless these are all conjoined conditions, I don't strike me that these are the particular way. Remember, the question is not, are social media platforms kind of like cigarettes or bad like cigarettes, but are they bad in the way that cigarettes do? Is this a similar phenomenon? And the big distinction here, I think, is between causes and conditions. It is true that I've, social media has pr pr provides conditions for very negative things. In fact, all the things Father Dom said, I, I fully agree with. These are real problems, but they're conditions that one accesses freely 
and, and has to have, of course, influence on, but they're conditions for, but they're not causes of in the way that a cigarette with a physical causality is. The addiction of physical of a cigarette is a very serious, serious thing. And it's something that, and the damage done to secondhand smoke and individuals is a causal physical na nature. You can't separate it. With social media platforms distinctly, it involves freedom and virtue and acting on them. And it is something that we can separate out, although I admit it is challenging. But the idea that we should give up social media platforms or lump them in with a physical addictive quality of cigarettes strikes me as maybe putting human beings on a little bit too low of a bar. Thank you, Father Bonaventure. We will now have Father Dominic's concluding response. Father Dom. Yes, well, thank you, Father Bonaventure. Uh, I think we are moving, getting somewhere. I would totally grant that uh, that the, the, the mode in which these two things are addictive is gonna differ. Uh, of course, smoking introduces chemicals to your body. Uh, using social media does not. And so we shouldn't expect to see chemical, a chemical kind of dependency and addiction. Uh, but it still is addictive. And that's, that's enough of a connection for the A position, as, as I see it. And I, I agree that correlation does not imply causation. So it's important to try to recognize um, what, kind of, what kind of causal mechanism might be at play here. And we actually have some professors there at Providence who are doing just this. Um, uh, Professor Chris Limios and, and Father Big Marquis just published in that, from the economics department, a fascinating article just examining a potential mechanism for why it is that social media platform use tends to correlate with uh, depression and, um, and unhappiness. And uh, they, they highlight something called the Easterlin paradox, who was developed in, in economics. Uh, Easterlin observed that if everyone's real income increased by the same amount, the positive effect of the increased income on individual happiness is offset by the general, by all the boats rising. And they posit a, a similar mechanism at play with social media accounts that, that uh, by their nature, you tend to post the most positive experiences, the most attractive pictures. And so you're constantly, users are constantly comparing their life, their appearance to these uh, experiences of others and to the appearance of others. And it, it leads to greater and greater unhappiness. And there's a, that's a plausible uh, causal mechanism for this kind of, of correlation that, in, that indicates that there's a real effect here. Um, so I, I would agree that this is something that needs to be studied further. But I think the evidence is, is mounting that shows that this is uh, having a real effect. And, um, and I would say that uh, with respect to um, harms and regulation, uh, I think it's absolutely important to, to recognize that when a company is, is, um, is, is well, selling a product, in this case, you, your attention, your uh, certainty of your desires to advertisers, that if that product is causing harm to individuals and to society, that there must be some external regulation for the sake of the common good. And we shouldn't look to social media companies as being able to do that on their own. So I, I would say that that, that point still holds. Um, and, and I would just, I, so I will grant that you're right. Um, the, the, if we're looking for uh, a chemical, uh, mechanism by which a product causes harm, um, then we're not gonna find that in social media use. We have to look at the kind of conditioning of behavior and the kind of effects which are proper to mental health. I totally acknowledge, of course, that the, that the, um, that the conditions and the, the causes of difficulties with mental health are very pluriform. There's lots of them. And so this is, but this is clearly appearing to be a contributing factor and one that is uh, that poses grave societal harm just by the incredible breadth of the of the use and frequency of use of these platforms. Uh, and I think it'd be it's important to point out too that what's driving the um, the uh, the growth and the addictive quality of these platforms are machine learning algorithms that are getting better and better 
with every uh, use of the of the technology, such that uh, such that the the human the weaknesses of human psychology are being exploited more and more efficiently uh, through a constantly iterative process of refining these algorithms, and so uh, so we should be wary of this of this harmful effect, and uh, and not concede that this is just like any other. Um, uh, uh, way of connecting and um, and communicating with the people we love. All right, thank you both. Uh, we will now move into a question and answer period. I received a few questions already, which I appreciate. Please uh, please send a few. I will start with uh, with this general question, and that is uh, for each of you, which argument of your opponent did you find most challenging or persuasive and why and 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 how might you begin to answer that most challenging question uh either one of you can start i'm happy to start so i i think that father bonavich made a really good argument about uh the the, the very important difference between cigarettes and social media platforms which is that the harms associated with cigarettes are seem to be uh, per se associated with their use, meaning that um, just by virtue of smoking a cigarette, you're ingesting something that's harmful. You know whether it it actually leads to cancer in that in that case, or whether it's whatever it is, it's it, it is introducing something a harmful substance to your body. Whereas with social media use, um, you can envision. Uh, a, I mean, someone with a lot of self-control, perhaps, or just uh, or a lack of real interest in these platforms, uh, to to use it just occasionally and not get kind of sucked into the the phenomenon of keeping up with the Joneses and, and the various other um, deleterious effects. So I think that was a great a great point that he made, just about how close, like, is it a necessary effect? Um, Whereas I was kind of arguing more at, well, it, it increases risk, the risk of harm, um, as opposed to it's inevitably and necessarily harmful. Yeah, um, I actually think that the, the individual good one, and again, is the, is the, the toughest one. I thought the, uh, the psychological uh, effects, so that it is true that it's not a, a physical cause. I think there's this important thing, we're not doing the debate. Um, but the, the arguments of that, that this, the studies that show the correlation, the deep correlation of depression, of, uh, of lack of social development, surprisingly enough, of, of self-harm, of all these things um, that are, are, are involved there, the kind of technologiz technologization of your desires. So the way that it, I mean, the body image stuff, these are all extremely bad, extremely bad. And uh, the the data seems to indicate that we aren't nearly as strong psychologically. I mean, this is how advertising works, right? Turns out we're all kind of we're, we all suffer from behavioralism in a way, um, and that social media, the the fact that it's getting stronger and stronger algor algorithmically, means that well, it's it's darn close to causal, uh, given the the lack that most of us aren't saints or in religious orders, and so it that's certainly an individual harm. That's darn. That's again darn close to causal, uh, and because the harm is so significant, uh, it might be worth being being wary of that or that point oversized as opposed to the terministic harm of say, cigarettes. Thank you. Uh, a student asked a question that I think it's good to bring up just in terms of understanding disputation. Um, they asked how we're defining social media. Uh, which is a very important question. I'm not sure we define that term. Uh, and so whenever you're debating, definite, defining the terms is so important. Have we been working on a common definition? And in this context, actually someone else mentioned uh, something like LinkedIn, which is a different kind perhaps of social media. I don't know if, if that's relevant. Um, so the nay position, the opposition starts, I suppose, with most of the objections. So I guess, we didn't, I mean, I guess I kind of set the terms in a way. I think we kept it deliberately vague because social media is so fluctuating. One, two, we have no, neither of us have any idea about it. 
Um, so, but LinkedIn, what I conceived of as, and it sounds like Father Dom did the same, would be uh, any, so LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, anything that digitally you can share with someone else in this way. I think websites we probably didn't have in this conceived, of, but also, so we included, include, excluded those, but also it wasn't just about cell phones, for instance. This, I think this would be a very different disputed question if it was about cell phone use. Um, because that's, that's a distinct, I think that's a harder position for the NAE position to do. But that's, in my mind, it was any sort of um, electric media that you about sharing things, and again, central cases. Uh, Aristotle, when he does definitions, gives you a focal case. He doesn't think you can per perfectly parse things out, but he says there's a central case that a paradigm that everyone kind of groups around. And I think Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat were my kind of focal images, and then I, things around that as they related. Yeah, and I, I would say that. It, it's a very good question because it is essential to, to define your terms well. And I think I think that we were probably had in mind something of the same set of of platforms. I think that uh, maybe I, you know it's hard. I guess when you're in the midst of a disputation to to be able to see that. So you might you the you the audience might might have a different opinion. But it just it seemed like we were that that it was more kind of defining the link between. Uh, between cigarettes, like what is the, the the key point of that metaphor that is at issue? That seemed to me to maybe be a little bit looser, but that with respect to what social media platforms are, I felt like we were kind of talking to each other, um, even if we didn't clearly define it, which is, you're right, we should have done that. Um, I have lots of good questions now. Uh, I'm just going to go to this one. The father's focus on the intrinsic properties of cigarettes and social media. But the questioner would have thought that the larger issue is whether or not the social trajectory of cigarettes will be mirrored this century by the social trajectory of social media. For example, in the 20th century, it increasingly became the case that more educated and wealthier citizens stopped smoking in larger numbers. And now that this is having a greater and greater impact on the less educated and poor citizens, a similar phenomenon is occurring with social media where more educated and wealthier families are preventing their children from consuming social media. And there are some reasons to think that this will, uh, that, that, so that that will follow the same trajectory as cigarettes. Any thoughts on that, Father Bonaventure? I thought a lot about this one because, and I kind of teed it up at the beginning, uh, although it wasn't directly related, is, is there's a many ways you could address this issue. So is this, are we, the disputed question are the social media platforms, the cigarettes of the 21st century, is that a descriptive claim? Are you asking a predictive claim? Is it a normative claim? Like, what are we asking about there? And it isn't clear at all from the question. This is great. We need to distinguish the, the meaning of questions that you could have thought, oh, are they going to do some sociology or some history or some prophecy or something like that? Um, because you've got two Dominicans, one a philosopher and one a theologian, um, you were going to get a normative, especially since one, both of us deal in morals, a normative uh, metaphysical kind of question about connections and uh, properties and also about rights and wrongs. So I agree that um, when, if you came into this, maybe from a different perspective, say you weren't, yeah, a metaphysician or something or a Dominican, then this, yeah, that's exactly right. So we, we didn't clarify that, uh, which, which way I mentioned I was gonna go normative instead of descriptive at the start but um, that's perfectly right. You could do, and that would be a different, very different thing, a different dispute, because then that's about looking at data about the practices in this and comparing that as opposed to other things, but that's exactly right. Uh, that's, that's great. I, I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna do one or maybe two more questions so we are absolutely sure we finished within an hour. Uh, Father Bonaventure asserts that social media does not pose per se physical harm to the body, and yet this person says there is extensive evidence that dopamine is released in the orbital frontal cortex of the brain where neuron activity has been shown to have detrimental and harmful addictive, addictive effects on the body similar to other substance abuse. How does Father Bonaventure assert this? Uh, as there's so much evidence of physical damage that is insidious. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was not, I guess I was comparing the, looking at the, in relative comparison to the death and the damage that cigarettes cause, 
um, in terms of the numbers of people, the symptoms and all this. There is data about cell phone uh, that it does cause some of this. I'm not familiar with that particular study of it for sure, um, but uh, there's, other, there's other things out there. So yes, there, I, I mean, anytime you have some physical connection, you're gonna get some physical experience. I think that's, if, if that is, if that's one, a connection, and two, if it's a serious one, um, that, that dopamine receptors actually make significant things. I think, again, I was focusing, I guess I should make explicit the relative physical kind of difference. I mentioned this about the eyesight, like it clearly hurts your eyes, it could do that, but that's a trade-off. If the dopamine one is actually significant, uh, causing significant damage to life in a way that lung cancer uh, causes, then that, that would change that argument. That's a great, yeah, I agree with that. And if I can just add real quick, it just, I think also it's important to, to note that, you know, the release of dopamine, dopamine is, is, you know, the dopaminergic system is associated with the seeking system. You know, it's seeking out of reward. And so, you know, there's a sense in which dopamine is, is released just by seeing a human face, you know? So, you know, there's a, there's a uh, in some sense, what's kind of most problematic about the way that dopamine is being released is that you have like news feeds and various other interactive components of the social media platform that are designed to, to, to give you that dopamine hit, to keep you engaged, to keep you focused on the, on and, and using uh, the media platform. And you're being manipulated, of course, because what they're doing is collecting data on your use and trying to get you to look at ads. I mean, so it's not for your good, it's to sell a product. And so that's, so in that case, it's kind of similar to like a slot machine, right? You know, you, if you go to Vegas and you pull one, you know, you use a slot machine once or twice, you're probably gonna be okay. But if it becomes, a habit and that dopamine uh, pathway becomes habituated, you can have an, an addiction. Thank you both. We're gonna move on to the determination. And I'm just gonna say a couple words about determination. Again, in the, in the spirit of trying to frame this conversation and also explain a little bit about how medieval and, and classic Dominican disputations would work, they would often end with some kind of determination. And the reason for this is to help us remember that the purpose of this exercise is not just the fun of the, the back and forth itself. Um, it's not just to raise lots of questions and, and, and create confusion. The purpose is to move us closer to the truth, to sort of interrogate each other's views and interrogate each idea and see whether it can stand up to, to the best questions and the best arguments. So, the determination is one way of recognizing that the pur purpose of this exercise is to, is to move forward and to try to learn and, and, and discover our convictions. Um, so in the medieval education and medieval approach to the determination, there'd very often be some kind of master who had studied the topic extensively and he or hypothetically she would take the arguments as they, as they unfolded and, and work them out and give a kind of answer. Today, we're gonna to ask you to serve as, as the master, as the determiners. And as you make your deliberations and determine for yourselves who, who in this debate or which side of this debate was most persuasive to you, because I should recognize both of these guys took a position, not necessarily based on their own convictions, but in the service of the debate. And so, so neither of their views are necessarily their own. Um, which side was, was most effective? I want you to think about three things. And the first one is the debate is not personal. So we are in pursuit of the most coherent argument, not just the most appealing personality. You have before you two very appealing personalities. We are obviously not judging this debate on, on whose hair you prefer or whose rhetorical skills are better or who spoke louder or- More visual like aids. More, or who had more visual aids. That's not the purpose. Um, instead, let's try to focus on the arguments themselves, and, and, and that is to say, which, what are the conclusions they drew, and how do they support those conclusions with evidence? Second, uh, we all came into this debate with certain presuppositions based on our own experiences with social media or perhaps cigarettes, and there's probably some wisdom in our presuppositions, so I don't want to just dismiss that. But at the same time, I'm going to ask that all of us sort of hold in one hand uh, the presuppositions that we brought in, hold those presuppositions lightly. And in the other hand, we should hold the debate that we just heard and the arguments that we heard and the strength of each argument. And we want to sort of measure how do our presuppositions stand up against the arguments that we heard. 
do the arguments modify, enhance, uh, overturn our presuppositions. So it's very good to recognize that we all came with a certain perspective and that hopefully this debate has helped us to think more deeply about that perspective. And finally, we need to focus on the question itself. Are social media platforms the cigarettes of the 21st century? So any debate is gonna have certain tangents or certain side questions, but as we decide the answer to the question, at least a first answer, uh, a contingent answer, we need to go back to the question, what, what is the answer to this question? Are social media platforms the cigarettes of the 21st century? So I'm gonna ask you to answer that question based on the debate you heard. We're gonna have the question appear in the chat uh, now. So if you would please sign into that survey and answer the question and we'll see how the debate turned out. I'll give you just a minute and then I think uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Hain wants to put the answer in the chat or if he wants to appear on screen and give us the conclusion. Uh, while he's doing that, I'll just I'll just note that <laughs> the answer to this question is not necessarily who wins in terms of the majority. As you know, very often in history, the those who are closer to the truth were in the minority. So, uh, so this question is ongoing, and and uh, and we're not trying to make a claim that that majority wins in terms of which is right or wrong. But we're curious to see how the debate went. So, Dr. Hain. It is uh, an honor to be able to report the results of the first Disputatio project event. And remarkably enough, uh, I'm, I have to say that the, there were 40 responses, 20 yay and 20 nay. <laughs> That's good. That's, you couldn't I think ask that for means better. they want another hour of disputation. <laughs> Try to settle it. And, and about 20 people chose to keep their opinions to themselves, which is uh, understandable, I guess. All right, everyone, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It was, a, it was a great event. Thank you, Father Bonaventure, Father Dominic, for, for all the work you put into this. And we'll see you next wait, year for another debate. Wait, oh, we've yes. had more submissions since you said. <laughs> yes. We're now up to 49. Let me check the results. Good, right. odd number. It takes a second for SurveyMonkey to load the results. Forgive me, just a, just, just a second. This is this is intense. It's a, I, I know it is. It, I've got 50 <laughs> results, but it's still only giving me 40 uh, analyzed results, if I can put it that way. Oh, hanging chads. I'm having hey. to refresh. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe everyone should, uh, everyone of course is dismissed. Thank you for those students who are able to join us and, uh, and we'll leave it as a cliffhanger. SurveyMonkey is keeping the secret for itself. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>